for this video, I'm about to get right into it because this is an interesting topic that I've heard about for years, but I have yet to see someone make a full in-depth video about it. But before I get more into the video, I would first like to thank you guys for coming to see this because you guys could be doing a million other things right now, but instead you're here with me and I appreciate that. If you guys like the content, you guys should like comment and subscribe to help the channel grow also follow my instagram too that would be greatly appreciated all right without further ado let's get into the video for years it's been talked about that in the early 2000s there was a plan to start a black owned record distribution company the people who were at the forefront of this were suge knight who co-found death row records Jay Prince, who co-found rap lot Records, and Irv Gotti, who co-found Murder, Inc. Records. Now, right off the bat, I have to address something. It has been reported by outlets and various people throughout the years that Dame Dash was a part of this plan. Me, personally, I don't believe that he was because throughout my research, I haven't really heard Suge, Irv, or Jay Prince bring up Dame when talking about the plan. I've read a bunch of different articles and have listened to various interviews interviews about the situation and don't recall them mentioning Dame at all. I could be dead wrong though, but I was reading a hip hop uncensored article and they were talking about a Dame Dash Sway in the morning interview. Without access to the interview, I can't really verify what Dame said if he actually said it. But let's get back on track and according to Irv Gotti, it was Suge Knight who spearheaded the plan. To understand the magnitude of this situation, we must quickly delve into what happened with each individual involved before the plan. Suge Knight would co-found Death Row Records and there were a force to be reckoned with in the 90s. The label housed rap legends like Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre, Tupac, Nate Dogg, etc. At the label's peak, it's estimated that they were bringing in over a hundred million dollars in a year. Also, in one year alone, Death Row Records sold more than 16 million albums. The label is also estimated to have sold nearly 150 million albums worldwide and has generated close to 750 million dollars in revenue. At Suge Knight's peak, it's said that his net worth was over a hundred million dollars. Jay Prince would be a co-founder of rap Records. The label enjoyed success in the 90s and the 2000s. They housed rap legends like Scarface, The Ghetto Boys, Bun B, Pimp C, Zero, and many more. Last but not least, we have Irv Gotti, and he would be a co-founder of Murder, Inc. Records, which grew to prominence in the 2000s with acts like Ja Rule, Ashanti, and Lloyd. Murder, Inc. just got a documentary made about them on BT, so if you want to know more about them, then definitely go check that out. Chris Gotti, who's the brother of Irv Gotti and also co-founded Murder, Inc. Records, would say that the label had sold over 30 million units worldwide and grossed over $500 million. So this pretty much sets the scene for these three people and why it was so important for them to come together. Suge Knight was from the West Coast, Jay Prince was from the South, and Irv Gotti being from the East. All of these people had success leading to the 2000s and Suge Knight would devise a plan that would possibly not just change rap but the music industry as a whole. The original plan reportedly was to start a black owned record distribution company. This might have been the initial plan but it grew to be something way bigger. According to Irv Gotti it wasn't a black owned distribution company and instead it was the idea of forming a union. Irv Gotti would say this about the plan and keep in mind that he was referring to should ignite. It wasn't a distribution, it was a union. In the music business, the artists, we have no union. There's no healthcare, it's nothing like that. It should be done. It was all his plan, and it was a hell of a plan. He was like, okay, so you've got a million dollar budget. We're gonna make the record label, make it a million and one. Now this will all get recouped back to the artist, but that hundred thousand will go for the union. The union was set to include all artists of every genre. With the plan, record labels were supposed to have front at the union dues to artists. How this would have worked is by including extra money into the recording budgets. Let's just say that Joe Schmo has a recording budget. They would have to pay the label back the recoupable cost just like they would with any advance when the album is sold. Irv Gotti would further say, now you can take your kids to the doctor because we have no insurance, 
no dental, no nothing. It'll go towards an annuity. It'll go towards a retirement fund. So now when you're a rapper and you aren't making so many records no more, maybe you got a million dollars that built up when you were hot. Furthermore, Irv Gotti would say that the MLB, NFL, and all other forms of entertainment have a union with representatives. They have pensions along with a bunch of other things. There might be some people watching this who feel like this plan was just merely an idea, but they might be mistaken because Irv Gotti would also say that Suge Knight and Jay Prince went as far as to meet with the same labor organizers who helped set up the players union for Major League Baseball. When I first heard about this union that Suge, Irv, and Jay Prince were planning, I didn't understand the magnitude of how big that would have been, mainly because I didn't fully understand what a union did or was. My stepdad is the president of a union, so I reached out to him to break down for me to understand what exactly I was getting myself into by doing this video. Most of my audience is older, and some of you may be in unions yourself. Since I just mentioned the MLB earlier, this year, the MLB Players Association reached an agreement with the MLB on a new five-year collective bargaining agreement. By definition, a collective bargaining agreement essentially is a written legal contract between an employer and a union representing the employees. The CBA is the result of an extensive negotiation process between the parties regarding topics such as wages, hours and terms and conditions of employment. Some of the key components of the 2022 to 2027 basic agreement that the MLB Players Association and the MLB would agree to was a significant increase to the minimum salaries, improved benefits for former players, and enhanced revenue streams through jersey and helmet sponsorship agreements. That's dealing with sports, but just imagine that translation to the music industry and you will see why this was a big deal. There are various pros and cons to some people about having a union, but upon having a union, it would ensure fair wages, benefits, and better working conditions for its members. Some viewers of this channel might already know that I'm a huge wrestling fan. I've mentioned it a couple times on this channel, but some older people might recognize the name Jesse the Body Ventura. He, along with many other wrestling legends like Bret Hart, Roddy Piper, Sting, and Chris Jericho, are for unions and professional wrestling. There's a famous story as told by Jesse the Body Ventura that right before WrestleMania 2, he stood up in the dressing room and tried to unionize the wrestlers. There was nobody from the office in the locker room besides the wrestlers. With the first WrestleMania being a success, Jesse's plan was for the wrestlers to refuse to wrestle and go public to say that they wanted union representation. Jesse's plan was foiled when he got a call from Vince McMahon who was the then owner of the WWF at the time. He would find out about the plans to unionize and be super close to firing Jesse. Now as to who ratted out Jesse, it would be the immortal Hulk Hogan. Jesse would get into a lawsuit with Vince McMahon and under federal deposition, Jesse found out that Hulk Hogan had snaked him out to Vince McMahon. This would hit Jesse pretty hard because Hulk Hogan was his friend, but he would soon understand why he did it, which leads to the important part of this story. In court, according to Jesse, he found out that for WrestleMania 3, Hulk Hogan made more than all of the other wrestlers combined. Why would Hulk Hogan want to unionize if that was the case and he's already getting taken care of? Vince McMahon obviously was not a fan of the union idea and there have allegedly been people in wrestling that have been blackballed for expressing their desire for a union. But so far to this point, I've only really told the perspective of the black owned distribution company in union from Irv Gotti's perspective, but here's what Jay Prince had to say about it. What we had done is had a meeting in LA and we should ignite Irv Gotti and Jay Prince were considering starting a black owned distribution cause we felt like it was a need for an artist coming after us and we wanted to make a better way and a smoother way for them. Because even back then, I saw what change was trying to take place in the industry and they wasn't gonna allow, I call it a conspiracy. I saw the conspiracy taking place where they wasn't gonna allow any more Master P's, Cash Money, Irv Gotti's independence. They was like shutting the door. So in my mind, I was like, let me counter that and make another avenue for the youth to come in after us. In 2002, there was the first West Coast Hip Hop Summit. Suge Knight would speak at this summit and he would talk about the idea of a union. Here's a clip of him talking about the union. 
is how many people want to have a union? How many people want to get together and say, okay, we're going to network? You got a deal at Universal and your points are too low. You got a deal at Universal and they got 100% of your publishing. You got a deal at Sony and you don't own your masters, but it's your artist. Now I'm going to tell you one other thing before you guys go, if you really want to know what's going on, this is real plain and simple. <laughs> A lot of record companies tell you that at the end of the day, you have the right to buy your master's back. So now you might be wondering whatever happened to this idea for a union in the music industry. Well, if you ask anybody that was involved in the plan, they will tell you that the feds came in for all of them shortly after people found out. According to a hip hop uncensored article in that Sway in the Morning interview, Dame Dash allegedly, strong on the allegedly, said that he had heard rumors that Jay-Z went to music executive Lior Cohen and told him about the plans. Once again, this is is super alleged especially since we don't have access to the interview and I'm just like kind of noting what this article said this is why I brought up the Jesse the Body Ventura Hulk Hogan story because if true which I'm not completely sure then that's almost essentially what Hulk Hogan did in that case I'm recording this part after I finished recording the script originally and I've seen comments underneath videos about Dame Dash potentially being a part of the black distribution company. Comments from years ago with people saying that they saw his Sway in the Morning interview when it was up and he was alluding to Jay-Z telling on the plan. At the start of the video, I said that I didn't completely know if Dame was a part of the plan and I still am not totally sure. Without the interview on Sway, it's really hard to know what was exactly said and this still doesn't make up for Irv and Jay Prince who have talked about this plan of the union or distribution company not bringing up Dame when they talk about it. Jay Prince has said that after the meeting of the minds with people involving the plan, someone left the meeting and talked about their plans. In the end though, all of these men who were involved in this plan would be targeted by the feds one way or another. Irv Gotti would get it really bad by the feds. In January of 2003, the Murder Inc. offices would get raided by the feds and Irv Gotti was set to face money laundering charges. Prosecutors said that he had aided famous drug lord Kenneth Supreme McGriff in concealing more than $1 million in illicit narcotics proceeds. While Irv was dealing with this case in interviews, he has talked about how the government stopped him from making money. In an interview with DJ Vlad, he said that at the time, Murder Inc. had been doing $100 million in billing for almost two years in a row. He had a joint venture agreement with Universal Music Group at the time. According to him, UMG was about to give him a check for about $65 million, and he credits this as to why the government came in on him. They raided him in January of 2003, but he didn't go to trial until late 2005. Irv Gotti would further go on to say that the FBI sent a letter to UMG and said that if they gave Irv Gotti $1, they were going to be his co-defendants in the trial. Irv and Chris ended up paying over eight figures in legal fees and ended up beating the case, which isn't easy to do, especially with the Fed's very high conviction rate. At this point in my research, I found out that Chris Gotti would also be a part of the union thing, according to him, which makes sense. I mean, his brother is already involved. But I bring up Chris because he's a firm believer that the Fed's coming for everybody involved in the union plan wasn't a coincidence. Jay Prince has a very very scary tale of what happened to him. They assigned a guy by the name of Jack Schumacher on me to arrest me or whatever he was supposed to do, but he sent death threats at me. Here's a man that killed eight people since they was investigating me. I decided to hire an investigator to investigate them, and that's when I found out this guy killed all of those people. Jay Prince has told this story on multiple occasions, and for a time, people were calling BS, but it's been since then that these statements that he's made have been proven to be true. With Suge Knight in November of 2002, a SWAT team raided the Beverly Hills office of The Row, which was formerly known as Death Row. They were there to serve one of 17 warrants, and let's just say that the warrants were four, it starts with an M, ends with a D, and rhymes with herder. 
However, Suge Knight wasn't considered a suspect at the time. According to MTV, there was a massive raid of 16 locations, including homes owned or previously owned by Suge Knight. In this article, it said that the charges from this raid stemmed from investigations into the gang-related slaying of Alton McDonald, aka Buntry, who had ties to Suge Knight and the alleged revenge slaying in June of Eric Daniels. But at this point, you probably already pieced everything together of what the aftermath was for everybody involved. While there is no documented link or connection between what happened to these people and their plans to unionize the music industry, there are people who definitely think that it was suspicious timing. If we want to go from the West Coast Hip Hop Summit alone, that occurred in February of 2002. This is when Suge was publicly talking about the union and the row would be raided by November of that year. Just months after this and less than a year after the West Coast Hip Hop Summit, Murder Inc. records would get Get rated. Someone else that I want to mention is Professor Griff, who if you don't know, he is a part of the legendary rap group Public Enemy. He would do an interview with the Cult Science Radio, which I also can't find to save my life. I can I don't know why I cannot find this damn dash in Professor Griff interview. I can just only find a tiny bit of audio of him talking about Dame Irv Suge and Jay Prince. In this audio clip, he says that the four men just named were going to put up 30 million dollars a piece to set up a black distribution company he would further say that all in one week these four people would get their offices raided which isn't true they were months apart and jay prince and dame never got raided and we're not sure if dame was ever even a part of the plan but at the end of this clip Professor Griff would say that after the FBI raided their offices and confiscated their records, they started piecing together cases against them. For a moment in time, let's steer back to the talk of a union. This has been echoed by many different artists throughout the years, and a big person in the rap sphere who spoke on this last year was Master P. I've done a couple videos on Master P and No Limit Records. The man is truly an icon, and he has said that he's talked about having a union for years. One of the problems as to why there isn't a union, according to Master P, is self-accountability. Master P is also quoted as saying, I feel like hip-hop needs some type of union. The NBA have it, what happens when a guy fall off? After he then sold millions of millions of records, even a female, what happens? Think about it, the NBA when they done, they go to sports center, they can sit around, where do hip-hop go? Go back to the hood. He would also further say that this union could be modeled after the Screen Actors Guild, which is now combined with the American Federation of Television and Radio Artists. In short, they're known as SAG-AFTRA. According to their website, SAG-AFTRA are committed to doing things like negotiating the best wages, working conditions, and preserving and expanding members' work opportunities. Mind you, all of this talk with the Master P thing was around the time that people like DMX and Black Rob had passed away tragically. But however, towards the end of my journey for this topic of the video, I encountered a Rolling Stone article entitled there's a musician's union, many musicians are aware or unable to join. This was released in 2019, and the article would talk about how Joe Budden was talking to two chains about a rapper's strike and union. It also mentions Taylor Swift as part of her joint contract with the label UMG must promise to hand over the artist on a non-recuperable basis a portion of the windfall from a Spotify shares in the future. The Rolling Stones article noted that artists talk the union talk, but don't talk about the unions themselves. Most artists and people are unaware that there are already two organizations that exist that are supposed to provide musicians with collective power. SAG-AFTRA also represents DJs and recording artists according to their website. The American Federation of Musicians is the other one and their goal is to elevate, protect, and advance the interest of all musicians who receive pay for their musical services. This is more for instrumentalists from what I've seen though. One of the most important parts of the Rolling Stones article was when it talked about Joe Budden and 2 Chains. Joe Budden was talking to 2 Chains about a potential union and rapper strike, but 2 Chains wasn't really going for it. In the article, it said that 2 Chains actually was automatically eligible for a SAG-AFTRA membership through his major label contract, as is 
anyone else who signs with Universal, Sony, or Warner Music Group. If you don't know, the music industry is pretty much dominated by what used to be four companies, but now is considered a big three. Those three would be Universal Music Group, Sony Music, or Warner Music Group. So according to the article, pretty much everybody is eligible for this union. Also, it's noted that a representative of 2 Chains declined to comment on his union status. If he indeed wasn't a member though, it's said that his label is still contributing almost 13% of gross earnings from his music to the union's healthcare and retirement fund. The problem that potential members of the unions I just named is that people who are interested have a general lack of knowledge about unions and how to join. They also don't know what happens when you join and why it might matter to be in a union in the first place. In the 1950s, more than a third of the American workforce was unionized, but in today's time, the number has fallen to a historic low with roughly 1 in 10 American workers now being a union member. Pertaining to the music industry, it's noted that at a point in time, the American Federation of Musicians high-functioning model almost had a 100% unionized workforce. At first, the producers were the boss because they would hire the songwriters and the band would be working musicians. Things began to change when rock and roll started to merge the role of songwriter, producer, and artist. With the rise in popularity of rock music, this model of music production became popular and according to a longtime American Federation of Musicians member, the amount of work that was under the collective bargaining agreement declined. There is also something else that's noted in the article that is said to be an obstacle that musicians who want to unionize face and it is unlike other industries. It brings up the example of 2 Chains once again and it says that hypothetically if 2 Chains was to hire a string selection to record with him he would be the boss. This then complicates things when he goes on to negotiate a contract with his label because now he's considered the employee and this is something that a union organizer and representative refer to as screwy. Definitely go check out this Rolling Stones article if you want to know more because it's an excellent read and I truly learned a lot by reading it. I did some further digging and found out that this year, Chuck D, Curtis Blow, and Dougie Fresh formed the Hip Hop Alliance, which is rap's first official union. This union is described as a nonprofit organization whose mission is to fight for fair wages, fair royalties, strong health and retirement benefits for artists in the hip hop and R&B community. The Hip Hop Alliance is only $100 to join and they're currently accepting donations. For those wondering, the Hip Hop Alliance is partnered with SAG AFTRA. In my opinion, this is probably the most important video that I've ever done. The crazy thing about this whole ordeal is that this is only the tip of the iceberg and it only gets deeper. There are so many potential rabbit holes in this video alone that I could have went down, but yeah, I just really wanted to give you guys this because I've been thinking about doing this video for a while. But definitely let me know what you think of the black owned record distribution company and or union thing. Let me know if you think that everything happened to everyone involved in the plan was a coincidence or not. Are you for the union or not? I think that it should also be noted that some people recovered after being messed with by the feds. I mean, Irv Gotti this year said that he just signed a $300 million deal. $100 million of the deal is him selling his masters with him only owning half because he's 50-50 with Universal Music Group. The remaining $200 million is from a company named Iconoclast, which will be an investment in his upcoming projects. As far as Suge Knight, some people can chalk down what happened to him as his own doing and or karma. Depends on how you see it. With Jay Prince, he would be targeted and it may have been set up to be killed, but the man still managed to do well. But since I wrote the script, the whole takeoff thing happened. So unfortunately, I had to mention that. So RIP takeoff. But I really hope that you guys enjoyed this video today because I know that I did. All in all, let me know what you guys thought of the video. I love you guys with all my heart. Peace.